Once again, I greet you, my friends, to Vernon McGee's commentary on the Gospel of Matthew. Today we'll be covering chapter 11. And in this chapter, Matthew continues the movement of the authority and power of Jesus the King. So the Lord Jesus has enunciated the ethic, he's performed many miracles, and he's sent out his disciples to present his claims to the people of Israel. So they've gone down all the highways and the byways, covering all the cities of Israel. Now, what is the reception? What is the reaction to Christ's messianic claim? Well, let me give it to you in one word. Rejection. And that's why this chapter marks a turning point in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. In this chapter, we'll see that he begins to deliver a new message. And it's a definite departure from the message of repentance in view of the presence of the King. Let's begin reading verse 1. After Jesus had finished instructing his twelve disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. Note here that having sent out his disciples, Jesus himself went out to preach as well. That's very important for us to see. It's so important for us to get the word of God out to the people. That's important for us to realize today, too. Then we read further in verse 2. When John heard in prison what works Christ was doing, he sent two of his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who should come, or should we look for another? You'll recall in chapter 4 that John the Baptist was put in prison by King Herod. And by this time, he was in prison for quite a while but he was always kept fully informed about the movements of the Lord Jesus. So John's disciples were watching Jesus very closely and reporting everything back to John. So John was expecting any day that the doors of the prison will be opened and for Jesus to come in and deliver him. This is because he believed that Jesus is coming immediately to the throne in Jerusalem to establish his kingdom there. And John's question is a very logical one. He had every reason to believe that the king would have assumed power by this time. So John is definitely puzzled by the fact that the Lord is moving so slowly toward the throne. Now note the Lord's remarkable answer to John. Jesus answered and said to them, Go back and tell John what you see and hear. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. And the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the gospel is preached to the poor. And blessed is the one who is not offended in me. So here Christ asserts the credentials which the Old Testament prophets said the Messiah would have. This is a direct reference to Isaiah chapter 35, where the prophet says, Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, the Lord your God will come with vengeance. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. So the prophet Isaiah is saying here that when the Messiah comes, these would be his credentials. And this is what he tells John's disciples, knowing that John would immediately recognize these credentials. Then Jesus defends John the Baptist, in case anyone there wanted to criticize him. We read, As John's disciples departed, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out to see in the desert? A reed swaying in the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man in fine raiment? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. John, by the way, was not a reed shaking in the wind. Quite the reverse. He was a wind shaking the reeds. In our days, the church pulpit has become very weak because it won't speak out and tell the truth. That's because it's been subjected to somebody sitting in the pew who doesn't like the preacher or the messages are being tailored to suit some small but powerful group in the church. The preachers behind the pulpit should be the wind shaking the reeds. But all too often, we behave like reeds being shaken by the wind. 
That's not at all the way it should be. Thank God for John the Baptist. That's why God chose him to be the greatest prophet of all time. Because he chose to be a wind that shook the reeds. And this John the Baptist was not dressed in a three-piece suit. He was a crude and rugged-looking individual. And the Lord Jesus defends him further, saying, But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is the one of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, and he shall prepare the way for you. So without a doubt, he was a prophet. But the Lord Jesus says that he was much more than a prophet. So Christ lets everyone know about the amazing superiority of John the Baptist to all the Old Testament prophets before him. The Lord states clearly that John is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 1, which states, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, says the Lord of hosts. So the Lord says that John was that special messenger who was chosen to introduce the Messiah to Israel. Then he says something very interesting. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Sometimes we like to debate who was greater, Abraham, Moses, or King David. Well, here Jesus states that John the Baptist was greater than anyone in the past. So between Abraham, Moses, and David, not one of them topped John the Baptist. You see, when the Lord Jesus came to establish his church, he separated to himself a very special group of people who would become even greater than John the Baptist. You ask, how can they be greater? Because they received God's grace through Jesus Christ and are clothed in his righteousness. Then the Lord says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven endures force, and the forceful take hold of it. This is quite a difficult verse to interpret, because the force can be either external or internal, and that makes for a difficult interpretation. The forces of evil from without are applying force to destroy the kingdom of heaven. That's true. But it also can mean that only those that are wholeheartedly committed can press their way into it. That is, they want to forcefully enter in. There's a definite note of need and desperation in their desire to enter the kingdom of heaven. We've seen that desperation already when one young man came and fell down at Jesus' feet saying, Master, I will follow you wherever you go. Let's read on further, shall we? For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you're willing to accept it, he is Elijah who was to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So the Lord is saying here that John the Baptist fulfilled the prophecy of the messenger to come, as recorded in Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. He was Elijah in the spiritual sense only, and not physically. The physical or literal Elijah will come to usher Christ into his kingdom at his second coming. But for many, the question arises, if Israel had accepted Christ at his first coming, would he have established his kingdom immediately? And would John the Baptist have been the literal Elijah? The answer is yes. You'll say, well, how can that be? And my answer is, I don't know. I only know that this is what Jesus said, and he can do things that I can't explain. In fact, he does many things that I can't explain. I just accept them. There are those that argue, well, if Christ intended to go to the cross and die, then his offer of himself as Israel's king could not be sincere. But it was sincere. They insist that what if Israel had accepted Jesus as their king? Well, the point is, they didn't. These are all hypothetical if questions that we're asking. And the fact is that the Jews rejected Jesus as their king. 
Hypothetical questions create problems that don't exist. And there are enough problems that do exist without us making more. Now, the next two verses contain one of the Lord's parables, and it's loaded with biting, sarcasm, and irony. The Lord didn't give us this story to hurt or harm, but in order to illustrate a great truth. To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to the others, saying, We've played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge for you, and you did not mourn. This parable portrays the Jews as a group of children playing in the streets. And one group of children says, let's play wedding. So they play wedding for a while and then say, no, we don't like that. Then someone says, well, let's play funeral then. But they don't like that either. So they go from one extreme to the other. And like spoiled children, nothing pleases them. They're a capricious bunch of children who just can't be pleased. The generation of Israel Jesus was speaking to was just like that. And our modern generation is no different. Now notice the interpretation Christ gives to this parable. He says, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Here is a glutton and a drunkard a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her children. So Jesus is telling the Jews that God sent them John the Baptist, but he was so strict and austere, they didn't like him and even called him demon-possessed. Then God sent them Jesus, who was sociable and friendly. Well, they wrote him off too, saying, He's a glutton and a drunkard, and he's too friendly with sinners. By the way, there is no scriptural evidence that Christ was ever drunk. So they refused to repent when John preached, and they refused to repent when Jesus Christ preached as well. But what did he mean when he said that wisdom is proved right or is justified by her children? By that, he means that the wisdom of their preaching is justified by the children it produced. Because through their preaching, many people did repent and entered the kingdom of heaven. And we see that human nature hasn't changed a single bit. I've learned a long time ago that there's always a group of people you simply cannot please. And you're better off just forgetting about them. They don't like this preacher because he's just too dry and monotonous for them. They think his sermons are too deep and they can't understand them. While that one is very demonstrative, he pounds the pulpit, but his messages are too simple. And so they don't like him either. There are a lot of people out there, you'll never please them. And that was certainly true in our Lord's day, too. Now, as we read further, we'll notice the tremendous change in Jesus' approach to the people. Remember that he announces himself as king. He's enunciated his ethic. He's presented his credentials by performing great miracles. And he preached the gospel that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In fact, he's presented himself so well that any rational person would have accepted him as king. But his own people rejected him. And their decision to reject him causes him to also make a decision. And so he rejects them too. He is the king, and the king always has the last word. Just listen to the change in his tone in what he says next. Then he began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. He says, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty miracles which were done in you were done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. Now, announcing judgment on people was not the primary purpose of Christ's first coming. But these cities, Chorazin and Bethsaida, are quite close to Capernaum, which was his headquarters. He performed many miracles in that area, but they still rejected him. 
And now he pronounces a judgment on them. So we see here that the gift of spiritual light creates responsibility. The Lord never ministered in the cities of Tyre or Sidon, which were quite far from his headquarters in Capernaum. But he did spend a lot of time and energy in the areas of Chorazin and Bethsaida. So he holds them responsible for the light he brought to them. Now, what the Lord says here makes me believe that there will be degrees of punishment and reward administered by God at His judgment. And even today, there are many people who have a glorious opportunity to receive Jesus Christ, but sadly, they turn their backs on Him. Please let me say this. I don't know what the Lord will do to some unenlightened person living on a little island way out in the Pacific Ocean who's never heard the gospel and bows down to a lifeless image. But I do know what he's going to do to that person who comes and sits through church Sunday after Sunday and hears the gospel but does nothing about it. I am very concerned about that person. Then the Lord denounces Capernaum, where he made his headquarters. And you, Capernaum, which is exalted to the heavens, you shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty miracles which have been done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. I think to myself, what a privilege was theirs in having the Lord Jesus set his missionary headquarters in Capernaum. But they rejected him. And he says that if the citizens of the wicked city of Sodom had witnessed the miracles that he performed in Capernaum, they would have turned from their wickedness and would not have merited the judgment that came upon them. This is the harshest language of all. And remember that it came from the lips of the meek and gentle Jesus. But here he speaks as judge and king. And today those three cities all lie in ruins. Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum were all destroyed shortly after by the invading Roman army. And although Sodom and Gomorrah were terrible places, God will be easier on them on the day of judgment than for these cities that heard the message of their Messiah and rejected him. And friends, this strong language should make us sit up and listen too. I would much rather be an ignorant savage in the dark jungles without having heard the gospel than to be an official in one of our modern churches having a beautiful Bible but never truly having accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Let's read verse 25, shall we? At that time Jesus said, I thank you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned, and have revealed them to little children. Yea, Father, for this seemed good in your sight. The phrase Lord of heaven and earth takes you back to Genesis chapter 14, where God is called by this name for the very first time. There the mysterious king of Salem, Melchizedek, blesses Abraham with the words, Blessed be Abraham by the Most High God, Lord of heaven and earth. This lordship is a fundamental truth that many wise and learned people never grasp. But the little babes, as the King James Version translates it, tend to grasp this concept very quickly. I remember many years ago, Dr. Harry Ironside once said, Always put the cookies on the bottom shelf as opposed to the top, so that the children can get to them. And we preachers should do the same thing too. That is, we should make our sermons accessible even to children so that they can understand what we're saying. Then you can be sure that the adults will understand it too. But I find often children are able to understand spiritual truths while the adults miss them completely. But the Word of God is never spoken in vain without bringing forth definite results. Let's read further. All things have been committed to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son but the Father. Neither does anyone know the Father except the Son, and to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Now these next verses bring us to a definite change in the Lord's message, 
and I think anyone should be able to make it out. Up to this point, the Lord preached, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He made himself known to all of Israel as their Messiah, and we see that they rejected him. And those cities he mentioned, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, also turned their backs on him. And ultimately the capital, Jerusalem, does so as well. And now we see that the Lord turns his back on the nation Israel and no longer presents the kingdom to them. That's because he exposed the religious rulers as spiritual frauds who didn't deserve any kingdom at all. But now the Lord Jesus is on his way to the cross and his invitation to salvation is to the discreet individual. Listen to what he says next. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This language is in stark contrast to what preceded it, isn't it? It's like coming out of a bone-chilling blizzard into a beautiful warm spring day, like going from darkness into light. This is a totally new message from Jesus, and in it we see that he turns away from the corporate nation to the individual. It's no longer a national announcement about a kingdom, but a personal invitation to find the rest of salvation. Come to me, all you who are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. When the Lord speaks of people who are heavy burdened, he's referring to those who are under the burden of sin. My friend, your sin is too heavy a burden for you to carry. You'll only get a hernia if you try to carry your load of sin. The only place to put that burden is at the cross of Christ. He bore it all for you, and he invites you to come and bring your burden of sin to him. He'll forgive you and release you and free you from all your guilt and shame. Because 2,000 years ago, on a cross at Mount Calvary, he bore all the burden of your sin. Next, Jesus calls us to a commitment to doing all of his commandments. That's what he means when he says, take my yoke upon you. You see, when an oxen is yoked for plowing, it's under the complete control of its owner. It doesn't wander around aimlessly, but fully obeys the directions of its master, who guides the plow behind it in the hope of receiving an abundant harvest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. You may ask, well, how does one find this rest? It comes because you don't have to worry about the many worldly things once you're committed to Christ. There is a rest which the believer experiences, and it comes through commitment and consecration to Christ. When you've taken his yoke upon you, you don't have to worry about recognition and authority anymore. You don't have to jockey for rank and position once you're committed to Christ. You don't have to be perpetually trying to get onto a church committee or becoming a prominent church official. You don't have to try to be a big shot anymore because you're yoked to Jesus Christ. His peace is absolutely wonderful. You won't have to worry about those things anymore. There are so many preachers trying to climb up their ladder in their denomination. They zealously pursue an office or position in an organization. I've seen a great deal of that. And I'm in firm agreement with Abraham Lincoln, who said, I would rather be a little nobody than an evil somebody. And frankly, I quit joining organizations because I got tired of seeing ambitious people lobbying so hard to be a chairman of some committee or trying to be a president of something or other. It's a wonderful experience when you don't have to worry about these things because you're fully committed to Christ because he will put you exactly where he wants you when you're fully yoked and submitted to him. I love this reassuring statement from the prophet Jeremiah where he says, it is good for a man who bears the yoke from his youth. So the message to young people is, when it comes to earthly things, 
Less is more. Aim lower. Don't be excessively ambitious. But aim to be rich and powerful in God's grace. Start on the path of obedience while you're still young. And that way you will surely be blessed. And that's a biblical promise. Intensely study God's word. The Lord says, learn of me from my word and then apply it in your life. And you will find a supernatural rest to your souls. And on that note, we finish this study of Matthew chapter 11. Once again, I thank you for dedicating your time and joining me on this channel. Please don't forget to subscribe as I try to continue posting quality Christian material. And in case you're wondering, I do not keep track of whoever visits my channel. That kind of information does not interest me. Once again, I thank you, my beloved. Goodbye, and God bless you until we meet again on this channel.